Hello? Hi. Hi, how are you? Hello. Hello, how are you? <laughs> so we have, uh, yes, Michael and Dick and Susan and Jess. Uh, welcome. So, Michael, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Michael Berillier, uh, software engineer, just been interested in the Open Worm project for several years now. My interest has mostly been from soft, uh, from neural architectures. What I was trying to do is take the, uh, the XML data and convert it into, or write a piece of code that would generate some LISP code that would implement some sort of framework. I was just just basically trying to come up with something that would you know make it easier to hack around on, on some neural structures. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, well, welcome. Yeah, we, we do a lot of different things in this meeting. We have, uh, like, uh, we talk about biology, but we also talk about the computational stuff. We do a lot of stuff with, like, machine learning and deep learning, but we also are interested in just any kind of thing that people want to do. So, yeah, well, I've done some, I've done some work on um, machine learning and also as far as um, neuro. Neuroscience, that's kind of like a side hobby. Okay. Something I read when I'm sitting at the bar and board ship us and just pull out a neuroscience book. Kind of a geek that way. Yeah, yeah, great. <laughs> Thanks. All right. Uh, so, anyone else? How are, how are you doing, Susan? Oh, I managed to make one of my models work. Oh, the okay. simplest one. Because I put it in what's called a T4 configuration, and then I realized, oh, it doesn't like sequential forces uh, added together on it. So if you just take one force at one time and let it settle, then you get a result. So I have to do each force individually because it has a refractory period, and I don't know how to program a refractory period into this stupid console program. So uh, it's you just have to do force by force by force. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. It, it works, so I'm I'm just gonna do that. It's gonna take all week, but mm. I'll get my data, and then maybe I can quit. <laughs> well, yeah, hopefully. Well, if it works, then you're at a stopping point. So. Yeah, and then you do what you have to do to get the data. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Hope yeah. you only need like 50 data points or something because uh, doing more than that will drive me nuts. <laughs> yeah. What kind of data are you using for it? <laughs> what kind of data are you using for it? Um, just to get a stress strain curve. Okay. For a, a tensegrity that I built that has a top part that's acting like the actomyosin ring it's in the top part of epithelial epithelial cells pardon me and um it has a center that's uh triangular also tensegrity which i should probably switch up into different configurations to see what works to see how it changes things and uh it Thank goodness it's only a three cell um, construct of tissue. Oh, good. <laughs> probably should do like a seven cell one, but. Oh, probably not to start. Then, I mean, I would get the three cell working and then move up. Yeah, and then, then I'd have some data and I'd have a model and things would go better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it, it needs a settling period before it. Um, before it'll give me data. Otherwise, it just bounces, I guess, all over the place and goes, doesn't compute. Or that's not what it says, but <laughs> not resolved. Yeah. yeah. Well, at least you got it working. Took a while. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, it took me a while to realize that, oh, yeah, that works. Okay. So let's do the, the series. Well, the series doesn't work. And I'm going, oh, okay, well, let's try uh, 100 and 200 separately. And then it worked. 
So, wow. Yeah. <laughs> it's, the, it's a finite element analysis program. And ten segregates don't work that well with finite element analysis because they have a large movement. Whereas what the finite element analysis is trying to do is a small movement to measure things. And you you push a tensegrity uh, um, quite often with a small movement and it changes everything, all the tensions in the tensegrity because the forces get distributed throughout it. Right. You know, you see this. With this, this tensegrity object, if you pull on it, the pulling uh, gets distributed throughout it. And if you push it, the, it changes configuration everywhere. Like the, the forces get distributed. So that seems to drive my console program nuts. <laughs> okay, and yeah. Like you said, it, it, it also doesn't happen all at once. Like it kind of changes shape and changes shape, and then it changes shape and changes shape again. Like it does this and then that. And yeah. So it's not a, not really linear sometimes. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be a lot of nonlinearities in there that you have to. Or I guess the whole mode is yeah. nonlinear. Yeah. Well, and it changes um, too fast, and I don't know. Anyway, it has this refractory period where it needs to um, finish contracting or something. Yeah, it's uh, put in push me, pull me into the. Isn't that a program? Um, I tried about? to get push me, pull pull you on my computer and I keep downloading Java because that's all I can get. Like it, it doesn't download anymore. Like it won't won't work. No. It, somebody has left neglected it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it looks like it. Well it's 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 good that you got it working at least in, in a very small way and then you know Yeah, it just needs to sort of work. That's all that's required because I'm switching this PhD to a master's degree and they said it could be discovery. And so I discovered how to make it work because it doesn't fit with finite element analysis very well. Yeah. At least in some instances. So good. Uh, I'm, I'm good. That's good. <laughs> I could yeah. do anything else. <laughs> Looks like Vahid's here and Hamanshu. Hello. Where are you, Vahid? Uh, it's a great background. <laughs> so I'm in a Starbucks cafe in Chicago. Okay. And we have been working on both uh, topics that we have been discussing so far. Uh, the one with Padre, uh, 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 I could resolve some problems that we have been dealing with. Uh, so I'm going to uh, concentrate on the presentation part uh, from now on. And uh, also uh, the other part, uh, we have, I've been also working with uh, Dr. Gordon and uh, Mohamed that uh, we have been presenting some, some time ago. Uh, some projects today. Uh, image construction. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think uh, we have been working quite by some suggestions that Mohammed uh, does, and I've been doing uh, some work with that. I could also find a new technical algorithm that could work on image construction. Maybe yeah, I could complete it as well. And yeah, maybe uh, we can do that. Okay. So you're, it's coming along. You're not. You don't really not in any sort of not experiencing any uh, obstructions or anything. Uh, for, for what? 
<laughs> well, you're, 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 everything's going smoothly. You're not having any problems. <laughs> well, yeah, but uh, I'm trying not to uh, yeah, have some issues that you know, maybe relate to the company problem. Okay. Well, good luck. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I don't know when you want to. If you ever want to present in weekly meeting, I would. I would. You know, even if it's not finished, because you know we usually like to. Yeah, Bradley. You might, yeah. Well, when he's ready, it might be good to have a general uh, introduction to voice. Oh yeah. Like so, like yeah. You know like what he's trying to do is use voice, but use technology. Right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Maybe next week. Yeah. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 seems to be the expert on voice. Oh yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh yeah, yeah. I mean. I I, uh, I know like the origins of voids and some of the work because there are, people have been doing a lot of work on voids like you know like perfecting how they all sorts of like different points of view of the agent and things like that so it's really interesting work but uh, yeah I'd like to see like kind of the state of the art there hello Luke uh, welcome and Morgan welcome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. Okay. So yeah, we're, we'll talk a little bit today about some. Uh, I have a couple of papers on simulations and large language models being used for biology. I also wanted to go over. I have the slides on. Um, uh, yeah, Michael asks who's on a question in the chat. I also have some slides on the 10th anniversary of Devo Worm, and I wanted to look. Uh, we wanted to go through them and see if I missed anything. So I'll go through kind of the slides that I have, and I don't know if I missed anything. It may be something that Dick could re refresh my memory on, or maybe other people. If I'm missing something that is, you know, pretty obvious, but I, I missed it. So let's let's get into that. So. Last week I told you that like this is the this week this past week was the tenth anniversary of Devo Worm. Back in April of twenty fourteen, we had our initial meeting and we had our initial GitHub uh, issue that we filed, and basically, you know, it, we've been going ever since. So I think we have maybe you know we take breaks from week to week, but it's not like um, you know we haven't taken a long extended break. Which I'm not saying that we will. I'm just saying that, you know, this is pretty, we've been going for 10 years. So it's like we got a lot of under our belt, and you'll see that in the slides. So, yeah, in the beginning, in April 2014, uh, Dick Gordon and myself and Steve Larson from OpenWorm, we got together and we discussed this idea of modeling development in C. elegans. And there's the OpenWorm project that's ongoing, of course, or that started. OpenWorm started in 2011, so at the time, it was pretty new. And so we, at the time, you know, we said, okay, we need a developmental component to this. So there was this original issue, issue 179 on the OpenWorm um, GitHub, and it was add cell lineage info to PyOpenWorm. So this was the cell lineage of C. elegans and putting that into a PyOpenWorm format. So a lot of the early work was like, trying to do some uh, well, data structure stuff or, or you know, um, that sort of thing. So there's Steve Larson in the middle. We were using Google Hangouts at the time because that's what we did. And uh, then we had our first public announcement in June of 2014. This is where I put this announcement on, on a blog and asked, you know, so it was sort of a call for involvement. We had a few more people come in at this point. And, you know, we're really working from open data sets. So the C. elegans community has a really nice collection of open data sets, uh, you know, from like uh, cell lineage information to cell tracking information 
to other types of information that you know you can use uh, and you know the C. elegans community is well known for maintaining those resources so it's the perfect sort of model organism for this kind of endeavor uh, then we did this paper in 2014 in October where we did uh, we, we proposed this four-dimensional model for the C. elegans lineage tree using an RDF framework so this is uh, data like proposing a data structure for the lineage tree and then having like a theoretical skin over it explaining why we're interested in this and very early on we, were, we expressed an interest in looking at differentiation and partic in particular what we call differentiation waves and this is something that uh, Dick Gordon has worked on his entire career or at least he's sort of the originator of the concept and so we worked on this uh, problem and, you know, kind of put out a first uh, proposal for how this might be approached. So uh, about five years ago now, and 2019 was five years ago, uh, we did a, I did a report on the five-year sort of anniversary of Diva Worm. So if we go back to five years in to the project, we have a lot of things, a lot of papers that we did, a lot of journal clubs. Openworm doesn't do journal clubs as much anymore, but we we did present at the journal clubs there. Uh, I've presented on different things at different uh, locations, such as the C. Elegans meeting, uh, and uh, you know we we have attended that as sort of you know been represented there a couple times. Uh, we've published a number of papers uh, and. You know, so we've we've really kind of had been productive over that five year period, and so this is at the five year point, kind of where we were. Um, and so yeah, we've had a number of logos throughout the years. You know, from the early days of the project, we're just kind of we made up a logo to different logos for some of their side projects, like the Diva Learn platform. Uh, and this is uh, software, open source software we've been working on over the last few years. And so, you know, we've, we've got a lot of tentacles in a lot of places at this point. So, you know, we started out very small. We've ended up kind of uh, not only in C. elegans, but in other organisms as well. So, um, and, and going back, I, I was looking and I was like, you know, this is incredible how much work we've done in 10 years. So um, we use a lot of Kind of secondary data we have this is an example of point cloud data so in the embryo you can take uh, microscopy images of the embryo and you can track the cell nuclei or at least markers that represent the cell nuclei and you can calculate cell centroids so you can calculate out the 3d position of those centroids you have the stack of images you have the the width and the depth or the width and the length of the images of each focal plane and you can get this three-dimensional point cloud. So this three-dimensional point cloud is in a, you know, they have a, a, referen a reference point to each other's, each, uh, you know, one cell to another cell. And there's this a data set from Murray et al. Uh, from, it's from 2006, but it's perfectly good data uh, that allows us to get, like, a probably, I think they have about three or 400 worms or worm eggs that they've sampled in that data set. And, you know, you can take those data and plot out this kind of point cloud that shows every cell centroid in development. And so you can see it roughly forms this sort of embryo shape. So you have all these cell centroids, and each one of these points is in a 3D location, but it also has information attached to it. So you have uh, position to 3D position. You have information like the label. You in C. elegans, if you have the label of the developmental cell, we know what it will become in the adult. So you can map this mass of points to an adult phenotype of the worm. So that's really nice. Uh, and you can do that in 3D because we have a 3D model of the adult. But you also have other things that we can extract from the data. So you have time and migration angle. So you can do this over points in time. So this point cloud is not differentiated with respect to time. If we wanted to, we could take different time points and point out, you know, plot out the points. We have uh, when cells divide, they divide at a certain angle. They divide and go to certain places. They migrate. You can 
you know, extract those kind of information. And what we've done is create this data structure, which is uh, multi-dimensional. So we can have the cell volume, the time and migration angle, and some other properties that we can modify with respect to our data set. So we've, we've developed this, and not just for C. elegans, but we use this basic kind of approach for other organisms as well. Um, now, in 2016, there was the Open Worm Open House, which was an event that uh, we put on with our community committee. Uh, and we did like a review of all the projects. So, and someone even prepared some uh, art for this. So, we had some person who was developing art for Open Worm at one time. There are some nice pieces of art that exist. If you're interested, I can connect you with this. Um, and then, you know, each project got an update. We, we did our update for our project. Uh, at the time, we had a number of projects going on in Open Worm. And this is a, a point that I'm making because there are a lot of things going on in Open Worm that people may not be aware of. So, you know, there, there are different ways of modeling neurons. We have uh, different ways of modeling and measuring movement. We have different ways of simulating the biophysics of a, of a, a worm and so forth. So there are a lot of different uh, sub-projects. And one of the things, and we need to do this again, is to kind of get in touch with a lot, a lot of these projects. So there's a nice set of resources on this open house that if you want to go back and look at that, it's a little dated now, but it basically gives you an idea of what kinds of things we've been thinking about. Okay, so the, in 2018 then, two years after, we had this event at the Royal Society in London, and they, they, they sponsor events uh, on different topics in science. And this uh, event was on our work in Open Worm on the C. elegans connectome, we called Connectome to Behavior. So it was people in Open Worm, some labs in London that work on C. elegans, um, you know, they're, they're biological labs that work on these uh, these problems, and they have many more resources than Open Worm. Well, where Open Worm fits into this is that, that Open Worm uses a lot of the secondary data and does a lot of computational stuff. So I know Steve Larson and some other people are interested in formatting data sets from stuff that's ex experimentally collected to something that can be used in a, pr in a computer program. So, you know, developing data structures for biological data. Uh, uh, Porig, who was mentioned, uh, is also interested in this type of thing. And, you know, we, we, we kind of have ways to, like, map those data sets to simulation efforts, to other things. So this this event was really nice because it gave the, the project a lot of exposure. Uh, Devil Worm was featured in one of the papers in the special issue that resulted from this. So we had some good exposure there. Um, and I gave a talk at Artificial Life 2020 on this idea of open worm being kind of misrepresented in a lot of people's minds. A lot of people think that open worm is about like uh, the singularity or like simulating life, you know, simulating life in ways that we're not actually doing. So I, I did this kind of humorous talk on how, you know, what we're actually doing in open worm and how it's relevant to like different scientific endeavors. Because I, I, I don't have time to kind of look at it here, but, uh, you know, and I may add a slide in because I have some slides on this, but there have been some pretty wild stories in the media about what Open Worm is doing. So it's, um, it's good to have a reality check on that. So that was something else uh, that we've, we've got. Um, and during the pandemic, we were doing a lot of virtual conference participation. So, you know, this is something that, again, is good to get the word out. It's a good motivator for different projects to get to a, a point where you produce like a paper or a presentation. And, you know, so it's always a good thing to, to kind of target these kind of things. And so we've done a lot of those in the history of the project. We have also done a lot of things with respect to different topics. So we've done things uh, with uh, cellular automata, and this is more physoic, and this is something that's open source. Uh, you know, it's it's a, a platform that uh, Tom Portages uh, sort of developed on his own, but we were using it in the project as a way to model uh, morphogenesis. Uh, we've had other things like we've worked with diatoms. 
uh, which are a different type of model organism. We worked on developmental connectomes, uh, machine learning, uh, differentiation waves in trees, and those sorts of theoretical uh, topics, and then developmental data science, where we've done data science, uh, data analysis with developmental data, as I showed with that slide with the point cloud. So, you know, we've done at different points in the project, we focused on these different uh, topics, but we've always kind of maintained a lot of the stuff. And I, you know, I find this is a good opportunity to go back and look at what, you know, like if we stopped using Morphozoic, well, could we use it again? Could we do things with it? You know, just to make sure we don't forget about things and they don't get swept under the rug. So the point here is there are a lot of things that we've done. We have a lot of resources. And, you know, if people are interested in working on something, even if it's something we worked on a long time ago, we can pick it up and revisit it and come back to it. So we've worked with a lot of uh, model organisms. We've worked with a surprising number of organisms. Uh, we worked with uh, uh, zebrafish data, uh, this organism that is the sea squirt. Uh, worked with diatoms and, of course, nematodes. We've done a little bit of work with Drosophila, with uh, mouse data, uh, with theoretical data and, and simulation, and then comparative development where we've compared different uh, embryo, you know, the embryos of different species. So in one paper, we did work with nematodes and with sea squirts and comparing those embryos. So we've done a lot of work, and I was surprised to see this wide variety of organisms here represented. Um, so again, you know, we're interested in kind of not just kind of these uh, questions about data and computation, but actually, you know, maybe like comparative biology and getting that fundamental aspect. You forgot the salamanders. Oh, okay. I'll put those in. Yeah. And so, yeah, we've done a lot of things with things like differentiation, trees and mosaic development. As a slide, just describing one of our papers on this where... You know, it was basically a reanalysis of the lineage tree where we had to take the tree and sort it every node of the tree uh, by a different criterion than what is typically done in a lineage tree. And then be able to take that and compare it across species and say different things about it. And there are theoretical reasons why we would do it this way. So, you know, a lot of the original C. elegans lineage tree was basically organized uh, anterior to posterior. And if you know the history of this, it was done by hand. So, uh, you know, Solston, who was the person who developed or mapped out that tree, sat at, a, at his desk and he drew it out by hand. And, you know, that, that has a lot of utility, but there are other kinds of questions you can ask and different ways you can organize the data that are also very informative. Uh, and then this is a differentiation tree for C squared as well. So this is our general methodology for these kind of what we call mosaic development organisms where they um, they don't have like uh, these mass tissues, you know, like where you have a bunch of cells in a tissue. Their differentiation occurs on a cell by cell basis. And so in C squared, you see this early in its development. And we have these kind of uh, trees where we can, you know, kind of do some, uh, we can model it, we can render it, classify the different cells, the different nodes, and then map that to the uh, to the phenotype, which you can see here. And so we, we talked a little bit about that in this paper. Um, and so, you know, we've been working on a bunch of things. We've also been working on cellular automata for uh, looking at development and pattern formation. So there are these one-dimensional cellular automata that evolve over time. And then we have these two-dimensional cellular automata. This is morphozoic, where you have a focal cell, which is in the middle, cells around that cell that, you know, the, they have interaction rules. So the cells around this focal cell determine the state of the focal cell in the next iteration of the simulation. And then in morphozoic, these are nested, so you can actually look at these kind of global effects. And reason I bring all this about cellular automata up is because there's so much here that we've not done. <laughs> we've we've kind of scratched the surface of it and then left it sitting there. Um, and we've had from time to time people wanting to do work on it, but it's really, I don't know what it is, but like there's something here that really could be like something if you want to 
do this, and you can do this with, you know, you can take data from a data set, or you can just model it with pseudo data or whatever. But there is something here, fundamental pattern formation, that I think would be really interesting. Um, so anyways, we've done that work. Then, you know, we have our community. We have our open source community. We do, we release all of our code in open source. So we have the Morphozoic work is open source. We have all the stuff we've done with machine learning. That's all open source. And so we have this nice community uh, where we have different resources, our website, our GitHub uh, site, which has a number of data sets. Uh, we have a, uh, a presence on GitHub and Hugging Face. Hugging Face is where we host our machine learning models. And then we have our meeting spaces, Jitsi, and also on YouTube, where we do a lot of things as well. And, you know, this is sort of semi-independent of the OpenWorm community because in, in our community, we're kind of doing the developmental stuff in OpenWorm, but also doing other things. So we have our own presence in, in on YouTube, for example, where OpenWorm has a channel and we have a channel and we do these things where we've done a lot of things over 10 years. I used to host an open coffee hour. <laughs> uh, and then we also have, you know, some of our work, posters, talks, uh, special things that we do. And so there's a lot here. If you want to go to the YouTube channel, it's just Diva Worm on YouTube. And, you, you know, there's a lot of content there. We used to have talks by people. So there's a lot of stuff there to explore and maybe follow up on. Then the, the International C. Elegans Conference, which is this conference. So C. Elegans has a really nice community of people who do, you know, they collect data. They, they have, they're very open about like curating the data and sharing uh, data. And it's largely, you know, it's really, it's really uh, not just kind of thrown up on the web. People have worked hard to, develop what they call defined mutants. So you can get C. elegans mutants where they have an, a gene that's uh, mutated and it has some functional consequence to it. So, you know, there, there are tools like that, but then there's also data sets like, you know, uh, lineage trees and other types of uh, open data, movement data and things like that. And so we go to this conference, we have a presence there and the last, well, we were there in 2015, I was there. They used to host it in Los Angeles, but now they've moved over to Europe. They moved over to Edinburgh, and that's where Horig is always the person going there because that's sort of where he's from, or, you know. And so uh, in 21 and 23, we did a poster, and uh, Diva Worm was in that poster. So we have a very small space to kind of advertise what we're doing, but, uh, you know, we, we get exposure in that community. Then, of course, we do our, our, our Summer of Code stuff. So we have our many, many Summer of Code interns that we've had since 2017 working on a variety of topics. And the way we approach uh, Summer of Code is we, you know, we take a project. One year, people you know, dive into a topic. They propose a topic. They do the work. We you know, develop some code. It's usually some sort of application. And then the next year we follow up on that project and, you know, kind of pick up where we left off and get new people in. So we've had quite a few uh, interns over this over the course of this program. It's been very successful for us in developing a lot of the machine learning stuff that we're doing, which I haven't even talked about in here. I'm not going to talk about that too much, but I think it's worth pointing out. And then pointing out that, like, also, if you're one of these people who participates in GSOC, you come into our community, you learn about biology and computation and those kind of linkages, but also people, you know, they're very ambitious and they go on to some great things. So uh, Asmit Singh, who was in our group several years ago, he's now a graduate student at Georgia Tech. Uh, Mayuk Deb, who's been in our group uh, quite a while off and on, he's He's been doing some great things. He wrote an article in The Gradient, which is a machine learning blog, uh, journal kind of thing. And so, you know, there, you can see them around uh, beyond evil worms. So it's great to see people doing stuff like that. Um, and so, yeah, we in, in 2019, we had this course, Devo Learn ML. So there's an educational component here that we focus on. 
And we did this 16 week course, which is all the materials for this are online where we we did a series of talks on different topics in machine learning. So um, these are all kind of available and, you know, it's a little dated now, but I, I'd like to do this maybe again at some point. But it, this is the kind of thing we do with our educational initiatives. We've developed the software DevoLearn, which is, uh, you know, where you have machine learning uh, applied to biological data, specifically microscopy data. So we have all sorts of microscopy data. Susan's been doing things with things like the ball microscope. We have data sets that we can mine to get these kind of, uh, we, we are interested in segmentation of data, but we're also interested in building higher level models from the segmentation maps. So, you know, we have to deal with all sorts of uh, issues with input data, such as cleaning it up, defining what we want to get out of it, and then building higher level models. And so in doing this, we're building this pipeline of different tools and, you know, it's open source, so anyone can contribute to it. But we're, we're you know, we're making progress on this. Um, and this is largely through Google Summer of Code. So that's that's nice, too. We've developed things like the pre-trained segmentation model, the embryo generator model, and the lineage population model. These are all kind of parts of Devo Learn, And, you know, they use different techniques. So I'm not going to get into the techniques, but... Um, they're really, you know, they're forks of things like GANs and the Segment Anything model from Meta. And so they're very state of the art, but, you know, they're, you know, there's a lot there to kind of, if people want to participate or contribute to this, it's, it's open source. So it's something we can do. Um, yeah, so we have a presence on uh, GitHub, of course. We have a for Devo Worm, which is like where we have some of our data sets, some of our legacy things. We also have Devo Learn, which is a separate organization where we have this software. And then we have, you know, but the problem is, is we have a lot of technical debt. And this happens over the course of 10 years where you, you know, have different, like I showed you that Devo Worm ML example. There's a, it's, it's kind of dated now. So, you know, Technology changes at such a pace, both in like computational science and in biological science, that there are all sorts of new data sets, there are new techniques, there's new technology, and we need we you know we struggle to keep up. Everyone does, and so when we do something, sometimes it's not the state of the art. Sometimes our documentation isn't in sync with things. So there's a lot of technical debt in Devo Worm, um, and one of the things we do is how we have this read the docs. So this is one piece of documentation we have, which is basically hasn't been updated since 2018. These resources on Read the Docs, and hasn't been updated since 2018. And, you know, we haven't really used it that much, but the point is, is that, you know, we have resources that people will come across coming into our community that are not, you know, in sync with things. So we recognize that, and it's always something, it's an interesting aside for the 10 years of doing this, that you'll have things like this in a project. And so it's not to say that we need to like, I guess we can tighten things up, but it's also kind of interesting to go back and look at where we've kind of gone and maybe revisit or maybe align ourselves with things that happened in the past, like these categories that are built on this, uh, in this scheme, you know, maybe our work is better organized this way that we've just not organized it that way in a while, or, you know, changing this to reflect what we're doing now. There are different ways you can do this. This is more of an open source curiosity, but it's an interesting point when you're going over 10 years of work to see this uh, in action. So we, we, you know, sometimes we focus on open questions. So Dick Gordon is good at this, coming up with open questions to address. Um, you know, some of the open questions that he submitted, this was back in December 20, 2023, is where, you know, one question is, is that you have uh, in, in biology, especially in like developmental connectomes, we have changing networks of neighbors from the point of view of one cell in an embryo. So when I showed you that point cloud and you can see it here, if I were sitting here as a cell and now we're looking out at my neighbors, 
right now we're looking out at these connections, what would it look like? What would be the view from where I'm sitting? You know, this is something we can model with voids. This is something we can do with network science. And, you know, especially with connectomics, it's very relevant because one neuron is do influencing other neurons. And understanding what that viewpoint is, I guess it's metaphor, but the viewpoint being, what am I influencing? What am I maybe, you know, trying to do in a, in a biological system as part of a biological system? That's an interesting question. And it's something, you know, someone can pick up a question like that and interpret it the way they want. Uh, and so uh, another thing is, can we shift diatoms, or, which are individual cells, from one category to another with what we call a CompuStat, which is something Dick wrote a paper on in, I think, the 1960s. But it's, you know, something that is relevant to, say, like cybernetics. So it's something we can look at from a modern perspective. And then there are other model organisms, these Sicilians, Apoda, which is a type of uh, worm, and they have this uh, literature. So there's a lot of stuff in biology that is, like, very obscure that we can pull forward into the present. There may be data on this that we can analyze, like images that people have published. It may be that we can, you know, pick up on a very obscure model organism that would be very useful for what we're doing in open worm and devil worm. So there are a lot of things like this that are kind of buried in the biological literature that we can ask questions about. We also do things like visit, revisit concepts. So back in 2021, we had uh, open questions about what we call environments. So sometimes you'll see things in papers called the environment, and you ask, what is it? What is its relevance, and how do you define it? So one thing is that the environment is permissive. So, you know, we, we have that, and then we have the environment being instructive. So we can build models around that and use that in our models and in our data analysis. And so we've lost people during the tenure. Steve McGrew died uh, a while back, a couple years ago, and he did this uh, talk, Principles of uh, phy uh, Phytography, which is this technique that he worked on developing. And this is a talk, this is the link to the talk. It's very, very popular. I, I don't know how many views it has. It's hundreds of views. For something like that, that's pretty good. So, you know, there are people who we miss who started in the group and then passed away. And there are a lot of people who've left the group. You know, it's not, a, it's not, we have core members, but we have people who come in and out and that's perfectly fine. Now I'm going to put a slide in here on like our contributors over the years. It's going to be pretty packed with names. Um, and so the next 10 years, you know, we have a number of topics we'd like to explore. And so I'm going to maybe add a few more things to this or, you know, modify it, but that's basically the talk. You know, I went over a lot of stuff there. And so, you know, that's, I think I'm going to do that long version of this on YouTube and, and release a video on this so we can get a handle on where we've been in our 10 years. So any comments or questions? I don't know if Dick had any. I know Dick wanted to go over these. It's great to, great to hear that. Yeah. Oh, was that Susan? Oh, just I'm popping in and out because it keeps freezing. Oh, okay. So I'll just be stubborn and keep coming back in. Okay. <laughs> well, anyways, yeah, I think that'll be the way I'll, I'll present it. I don't know if I missed anything. Uh, you know, obviously there's just so much to go over. It's, <laughs> but I think that's good. You know, and then like. You know, I, I hope that people can get, you know, say, okay, I, I, I identify with that or that's something I want to do or this is something that I can't believe we did. <laughs> so it's always good stuff. Okay, yeah. So we had this whole muting thing. Uh, now, Jess, in the chat here, so I'm going through the chat. Uh, so Michael asked Susan about her uh, project. He said, what about a force-directed graph implementation? And then Susan said, I'm looking at the mechanical properties of a model of epithelial tissue. So, and just, you know, uh, the, so Susan's been working on this model of something called tensegrity, which is like super stability. And so she's working on like cells in, in epithelial sheets. So it's not really something you see in C. elegans as much, but 
the idea is that you have these cell populations, they're hyperstable under uh, forces during development and that sort of thing. So yeah, there are a lot of methods you could try on that. The, there's a literature on modeling tensegrity, but it's like people are approaching it kind of, you know, uh, they do a lot of things with matrices and uh, accounting for different forces. And it's not as advanced as you would like, actually. <laughs> It's, um, there's even, they even get into crystallography to describe the, where the model is. Yeah. Well, like parts of the model. Yeah. And yes, definitely heavily into linear algebra, but it's, um, deeper into linear algebra than my, um, advisor, who's an electrical engineering prof and known for his linear algebra. Yeah expertise yeah so it goes beyond something um and it gets into mechanics and i'll eventually sort some of it out but i've got a couple of books and a nice paper or two on the mathematics of tensegrity and i can only read so far into them like i'm into the third chapter in the book and I'm starting to not understand it. And I have part two of a series of papers, and I don't understand that. Although it's giving me nice keywords, so I should be able to look that up. If you're interested, I can give a presentation on like the math of tensegrity because it's it's beyond me. <laughs> yeah. Kind of oh, that would be great. I'm yeah. an engineer. It's beyond me. <laughs> I have to study some more. Yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, it's not obvious what they're doing. And it, I mean, they could use better models, I think, definitely. It's just kind of like, this is a network, and this is the, these are the forces. And that's... You know, um, I'll, uh, I'll post this paper, the two-part paper. The first part was excellent, and it helped me out. I can actually end my study of this as a master's degree using just part one but part it's part two like i said that's giving me issues so i'll try and type that in there and hope that my computer decides to work yeah <laughs> so i'll put it in the chat okay yeah so the uh just said plus one for updating the course yeah this is something that i think jess was involved in back then even where my mouth that might be something I'm interested in at the educational level and might also be a good avenue to have Jen slash trainer experience as well. Yeah, we have a an allied group, uh, orthogonal lab, and we have people interested in like educational stuff there. And then, yeah, and then this whole thing. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's good. Uh, so yeah, so I'm gonna finish up here with a couple of resources on computational modeling. There's a nice uh, paper that came out on modeling, and yeah, there's the dynamic stability of tensegrity structures. So there are two papers there. So there's this pl new platform that's been released, um, and it's on modeling cell pop or cell. It's kind of like what you're trying to do in tensegrity. It's like modeling tissues as a series of cells and their physics, and then. Uh, some work with large language models in biology, which we've talked about in the last a number of meetings uh, where they're using large language models to build models of the genome and they're like analyzing, you know, genes in terms of their structure and generating genes, gene sequences and things like that. So let me see if I can uh, pull this up here. There we go, part one and part two. Uh, so this is, uh, Bio modeling with 3D and large language models. So the first thing here is Simu Cell 3D. So this is from Nature Computational Science, and this is a three-dimensional simulation of tissue mechanics with cell polarization. So this is actually very relevant to uh, differentiation waves, and we've been talking about this recently because we're writing a paper on this, where you have, you know, differentiation waves or waves that go through tissues and they trigger uh, expression changes in the cells that allow them to change their fate. So if you're 
you know, you have uh, a bunch of cells that are going to become muscle cells. There's a differentiation wave, and then there's some activity in the cell. The cell picks up the signal, and then it changes its shape, and then it becomes the new cell, and it changes its shape in different ways. So you have to model the the shape shape of the cell, the changes in that shape, and some of the, the sort of the mechanics that go along with that. So in this case, what they're doing is they have this three-dimensional platform where they're building models of three-dimensional tissue. So they're very simple, you know, like 3D models. Uh, they don't include every aspect of the cell, but they include enough about, like, say, the cytoskeleton that you can model these kind of changes. So this is the three-dimensional organization of cells, determines tissue function and integrity, and changes markedly in development and disease. So there are a lot of changes relevant to development disease, but also to, uh, you know, to other things as well. Just basically when an organism moves, for example, or when there's like tissue remodeling or something like that. Cell-based simulations have long been used to define the underlying mechanical principles. However, high computational costs have so far limited simulations to either simplified cell geometries or small tissue patches. So we can't really, I mean, we can model whole organisms, but there's a trade-off between the number of cells we're modeling and the detail we can have. And so this is a problem that is maybe overcome by better modeling techniques, maybe overcome by bigger computers, but it's a, it's a trade-off. So we present SimuCell 3D, an efficient open source program to simulate large tissues in three dimensions with subcellular resolution. So they model things within the cells, growth, proliferation, extracellular matrix, fluid cavities, nuclei, and non-uniform mechanical properties. So this is like we we're talking about with uh, tensegrity only that in this case, it's like you might experience a force in one part, in one cell, and in another cell you don't. And then this maybe propagates across the cells, but it does it. It's not like all the cells experience the same thing at once. So you find this in polarized epithelia. So we have these epithelial sheets we can model, which is a, just a layer of cells, these epithelial cells, and they go on to form like the skin and other things like that. Um, so you can get all sorts of weird shapes, as we know from some of our meetings, uh, spheroids, vesicles, sheets, tubes, and other tissue geometries. So we can find these in microscopy images. We can explore them, but modeling them, you know, it's either an exercise in visualization or, you know, we can model the, the sort of the physics as well, but it's hard to do it at a hot, at a detail, you know, at a high resolution. So that's what they're trying to do here. Um, so they want to really incorporate biomechanics into the visualization and do this with respect to the da underlying data. Doing so, we show that 3D cell shapes and layered and pseudostratified epithelia are largely governed by a com competition between surface tension and intracellular adhesion. So it's like where you have adhesion between the cells, whether they stick together or not, and then also the surface tension. So they're pushing against one another. Uh, they're creating tension. There's the surface, which is the cells kind of interlocked and in, in producing this tension force, but also there's adhesion. So they're adhering to one another and there's, you know, there's, they're packed in, but they're also, and they, they stick together, but they also have to move. And we've seen examples of this where they kind of move across, you know, one another. They kind of break, selectively break that uh, adhesion where they come together and adhere under conditions that we, this is why we're doing this modeling because we don't really understand the full reasons why that happens. And so this is something that we can, you know, this allows us to do this kind of large scale modeling. Now, this is a good uh, figure one here is a good example of what they're trying to do. So we have these large tissues, which is a collection of cells. They exist in these sheets. So they might exist in like these little tiny three uh, neighbor, you know, uh, clusters. They might exist in larger clusters and then they might exist in these sheets. So they have all these different it's a heterogeneity of things. Sometimes those can be deformed and there are forces involved in those deformations. So they expand, they contract, they kind of change shape depending on the forces they're experiencing. 
the membranes are polarized, so there's an apical end and a basal end. The basal end is usually attached to some floor. The apical part usually deforms upwards, so you have these kind of uh, little hats that they wear, I guess. And so there, there's a lot of shape change with respect to their other polarized. Uh, then there are things within the cells that we want to know and we want to model and have high geometric resolution because cells are not circles. We, I showed you the centroids, but that's not what a cell is. A cell is this complex geometry and they pack together in a way that's mathematically interesting. So you can do this with these kind of meshes that they have here. So I don't think this is fine in element analysis per se, but it's this mesh that you can build with a cell. The cell consists of a bunch of triangles. And the triangles then are independent. They, they change their sort of orientation and, and size, and they build these meshes that can then be manipulated. You can model different sorts of things like surface tension, membrane elasticity, pressure differences, and bending elasticity. So there are all these governing equations that allow you to do that. You can also have cell division, where you have one cell, which is a mother cell. You can have a division event where the cell pulls apart and creates two daughter cells. So you can model like division of cells. And you know there's this whole process within it where DNA is being segregated into the different poles and then pulls apart, and you get these two independent cells. But all they're doing here is they're modeling the geometry of the cell. Like they're able to just kind of pull the sphere apart into two parts. So, I mean, you know, that's that's useful. It doesn't describe the whole process, but it's useful. And so they show the computation time here. There's Cell Sim 3D, which is another platform, Simu Cell 3D, and IAS. So I guess these are different platforms. This is not uh, uh, CompuCell 3D. They don't show that. And they know that, like, Morgan is interested in CompuCell 3D. And we've done and stuff with CompuCell 3D in the past, but that's that's a different type of model, I think it's, and I don't know if that's what we call a cellular POTS model, so I don't think that's what they're doing here, So, but it's a, it's a, a, a similar approach. And then finally we have this, um, uh, these different types of structures that we can model. We have a vesicle with a lumen, we have a spheroid, with an extracellular matrix around it in the deep red. We have different nuclei within the cell, so we can model that in a sheet of cells. So this is a, an epithelial sheet with the nuclei inside. So you can model like a sheet and its dynamics, but also what's going on inside the cell. And then you have these tubes, which you see with neural tube in development, basically where a sheet of cells rolls up and the ends join together and form this tube. And a lot of times that that process is dynamic. So you might want to know, for example, how you go from a sheet to a tube and you want to model that continuously. You don't really want to model the endpoints because that's not the interesting part of that. The interesting part of it is how it kind of moves together and what are the physics. So this is a nice approach. Now they have a GitHub or they have a GitLab repository. So this is the open source aspect of this paper. This is uh, run out of the, uh, run, I guess, Runcer Simio Cell 3D. I don't know what lab this is. They're out of uh, uh, Zurich, I think. And so they're doing this. This is their repo. Uh, I think you can like clone it and run the model, uh, I think, on your computer. They have a Docker file, so they, have a, they run it on Docker. Uh, the readme here is basically showing this. This is a C++ cell-based simulation framework. You can install it on Linux or Windows. You know, just basically uh, follow the instructions. Uh, you can do it. I guess you can run it in Docker if you would like, or you can launch a simulation. Um, and yeah, the, and it basically creates a number of output files that we can then check and, you know, use that in, in the way that you want to use it. So it gives you, uh, I think, some visualization files. A CSV file where it gives you simulation statistics like cell area and volume. So this is something that we create with um, in in DevoLearn from like raw microscopy data, but you can actually run a simulation and then get the same information out of this. But this has now been simulated. Uh, and then of course we have these different meshes that we can do. We can visualize this using Paraview, so it produces these meshes. 
and these output data in a CSV file, you can use Paraview then to visualize it. So I don't think it visualizes it within the software, but this is, you know, this is good. This is the kind of software that we have to simulate cells and, and development. So I don't know how useful this would be for people, but uh, definitely it's something to look into more if you're interested. And we have a bunch of things in the chat here. So, um, yeah, so we have, the first of all, the two uh, tensegrity papers from Susan. Uh, Hamanchu said, a full-fledged course catered towards computational developmental biology with AIML will have some novelty and sounds interesting. That was with respect to the DVORM ML uh, course. Uh, Susan also dropped another link to tensegrity structures, the book, which is uh, Zhang and Osaki, which we actually, I think, ran through because they give some MATLAB code in that book on tensegrity. So that's, it's, it's largely matrix algebra, so it's not too difficult. But of course, matrix algebra is not, maybe not the best way to model tensegrity. But they give some code in that book. And then this T1 transitions thing just has a hashtag cells are not circles. Uh, Susan gives another citation here. How dynamic pre-stress governs the shape of living systems from the subcellular to tissue scale. That's from the Royal Society. This is, yeah, this this paper is, I guess, a paper on physics of tensegrity and why we're interested in it. Because when we see these models in 3D, we're modeling the physics sort of of like as they might be encountered in a process. Like, you know, we can model a process and we can have a certain efficiency. But that doesn't necessarily reflect what's going on in the biology. There's a lot going on in the biology that, you know, if you have, say, like a pre-stress where you have a certain structure, it can give you uh, stability long term or, you know, it can have certain properties that we're not really modeling. So, yeah, this is all good stuff. So, again, yeah, there are a, lot, there are a number of platforms for 3D modeling of cells and cell populations and this is something that again is a long term interest of the group, and I should also put that in the in the tenth anniversary talk as well because i i I didn't think about like you know bringing that back up because <laughs> we haven't really done anything with copy cell three d so much as we'd like and so but that's interesting we should talk we should revisit that okay let me uh, oh there's Hussein only Hussein here Oops. Let me share my, or I'm sharing my screen. So I'm going to go over to this other paper. And this is, um, so we've talked about large language models and modeling genomes before. And it's a really interesting area because we have a lot of genome sequences, full genome sequences now, where we can just take the, the sequence data and we can analyze it and find different things in it. There are annotations in it now, so people know kind of, what the coding regions are, what they maybe do. We're not, you know, our annotation isn't great, but we, what we can also do is plug it into a large language model because genomes have kind of a structure like natural language. And so we can do those kinds of things. Um, what they're saying in this paper is they're talking about transformers, which are a typical technique we might use to analyze something like, you know, microscopy data, or we might model genomes with transformers to find patterns in, in classification, but we also use large language models. And so what they're saying here is that this is beyond transformers to transformers and beyond large language models for the genome. So uh, you can use transformers and large language models, but there's this large language model aspect that's interesting. So this abstract reads, uh, in the rapidly evolving landscape of genomics, Deep learning has emerged as a useful tool for tackling complex computational challenges. So this is the stuff we're doing with DevoLearn. So this is not, you know, these are techniques that people are using, neural networks, different types of neural networks, transformers, things like that. This review focuses on the transformative role of large language models, which are mostly based on the transformer architecture in genomics. So large language models are, are like a language model where you take a data set of, of, well, in language, natural language, it's words or phonemes or, uh, you know, uh, like n uh, engrams. And then you uh, take those and you train the model on that. And it finds the structure and it generates 
uh, potential outputs. Like if you query it for something, it'll put in a, give you an output. It's like if you wanted to find something that had a certain function, it would give you an output. Now, you can use transformers and large language models as sort of uh, one of the parts of it. The other part, of course, the, of the language model is the training set, which you can use from like a, a full genome of an organism or a set of organisms or individuals from an organism. And so this, this gives you, uh, you know, a lot of power potentially to do bioinformatics type stuff. Building on the foundation of traditional convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. So this is CNNs and RNNs and, and you know, this is very found traditional stuff now. We explore both the strengths and limitations of the transformer and other large language model types for genomics. So some uh, large language models use transformers, other large language models use other kinds of networks. And the question is, is what's the best technique to use for genomic data? Because it's not natural language, but we know that these models can deal with like sequences of symbols and you know they can put them together in, in a way that's you know makes sense. It's there's a sort of um, I guess you could say a semantics, but probably more of a syntactics of the genome that we're interested in uncovering. Um, additionally, we contemplate the future of genomic modeling beyond the transformer architecture based on current trends in research. The paper aims to serve as a guide to co for computational biologists and computer scientists interested in large language models for genomic data. We hope the paper can also serve as an educational introduction for biologists. And so this kind of goes through uh, some of the ways in which we can use large language models, um, you know, and, and like some of the types of data that we can get. So we can get things like chromatin accessibility information, methylation information, transcriptional status, chromatin structure, bound molecules. So those are all types of data that are sort of epigenetic or, you know, like you have a gene sequence, how is it expressed? There are different properties of the gene sequence. There's different properties of the structural biology that interact with that. How can we uncover, like, you know, incorporate those data and then uncover the, the relationships there? So this just talks about the promise of large language models, combining them with other types of models, um, and getting, you know, some of the utility of that, um, you know, with transformers, uh, applying transformers to large language models, and especially genomic data, offer a new concept, a novel conceptual framework. We can use the attention mechanism, which is something in transformers, you know, we talk about attention as all you need and all of that. That's part of that whole framework. You can use this attention mechanism, which is basically where you identify certain things in the data and ignore other things. And that's that helps you sort of find the structure you're looking for. We can use attention to study the organization and grammar of the genome. So we can use things like that. You can use other types of approaches in machine learning as well. And we want to have larger models with large high predictive power. And so that's, you know, we, there's a whole literature on that. But it's, it's worth considering, you know, how these things kind of, you know, operate and, and you know, finding the best solutions. And so, you know, but also we have a lot of emerging techniques coming out. So, you know, the transformers have been wildly successful, um, but there's probably some sort of next transformer that might come out, something better to replace and use in large language models that's even better. And so this is, you know, kind of a call for being on the cutting edge to say, you know, we have these techniques that people probably aren't familiar with. There's this very uh, good technique that a lot of people maybe aren't using right now. And then there are up and coming models that we should be on the lookout for. Um, so, you know, with large language models, what we're basically doing is pre-training our models on sequences of biological tokens, such as DNA sequences, what they call KMERS, which are sequences of a certain size, or gene identifiers, which are maybe labels of what certain sequences or genes do or what their extent is. So like in bioinformatics, you often have like, you know, a, a start site and an end site for a gene. And we can use that to train the model. We adopt the term large language model, traditionally used in uh, natural language programming due to the pre-training approach analogous for the text data. So 
we're building analogies with like natural language and we're using this in uh you know molecular biology now you know that logic is is good and it's largely correct but we have to be careful because uh natural language has a lot of properties that your uh genome does not in terms of the sequence the structure of the sequence and so forth so this is a caveat that you know is something that they kind of talk about here but so they talk about, in this paper, they talk about an overview of the transformer architecture. They talk about this hyena model. Now, we've talked about the hyena model in the past. This is a model that's been released specifically for analyzing DNA and genomes. This is an implementation of a large language model. And again, it's, it's specialized, trained on, on molecular data, not on natural language. So it's, it's uh, you know, this is something that I don't have the link right now, but if you look up DNA and hyena or hyena LLM, you'll, you'll find the link to that, that software. I don't know if it's open source, so I can't remember how much of it's open source, but it's something that is uh, definitely uh, being developed and, you know, it's, it's like a very fast moving area. Uh, you know, they, they, then they talk about different deep learning architectures that people have used in bioinformatics. There have been some novel architectures. They talk specifically about the transformer hybrid models, which is where you use a transformer and the attention mechanism to predict assay data, and then applying transformer-based large language models and other types of large language models to the genome. Now, I'm not an expert on large language models, but I noticed that, like, if you go to Hugging Face, there are a lot of different open source models. And those models sometimes are general, but sometimes they're trained on specific data sets. The techniques that they use are specialized to analyze specific types of data. And so it's, it's you know, it's interesting how this area has kind of exploded in, like, the last year it, in, like, you know, what can be done how people are doing it. So there's a lot here that, you know, is, is kind of out there on the cutting edge. So, you know, it's something that at this point, you know, just simply kind of reviewing the different types of techniques that people are using and evaluating them is probably useful. Um, yeah, and I don't have any clue as to how much computational, uh, what kind of computational resources you'll need. I know you can run some large language models on like a Mac Silicon but you know you probably will need some sort of like you know AWS time for to run them well. So yeah, they give like a nice glossary of terms here if you're interested in applying large language models and what you know what how transformers work and all this. They have all these different terms that are used, um, and it's yeah it's 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 quite involved. Um, but this is basically the approach they're using. So yeah, it's a nice little paper. Again, revisiting large language models and their applicability to like the genome, which isn't cell modeling, but we have to be able to find patterns in the genome to say something about how it's related to proteins and the phenotype. So yeah, that's that's all I have on that. I don't know if people had anything, any any comments on that paper or on the other paper as well. Yeah, really interesting. Yeah. I'm going to follow up. I'm, I'm a little taking kids to school here, but uh, uh, yeah, just just wanted to add one thing that uh, the NetPine uh, bi monthly meeting is this week. Is the, yeah, the 18th. So that's Thursday. Yeah. Um, if anybody wants to join. Bringing up these kinds of you know, additional developmental, um, yeah, like basically kind of organoid, you know, who's who's interested in organoid modeling and, and who's potentially already working on it. Yeah, I, I, I can post in the Slack uh, uh, details for the meeting. If wants to join. Yeah, yeah, this is of course open source for. Uh... NetPiney, so it's like the, or NetPine, which is a Python uh, package. 
and I, I can't remember what it's what what it does. It, 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 so so um, it's kind of like uh, Bill Litton um, and and others. I think he's passed the torch now to. Uh, oh, I forget his name now. Sorry, it's it's uh, 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 I'm blanking on it. Sorry, I'm in the car, but. Uh, uh, it's a uh, kind of an extension of neuron to to handle larger multicellular models or like larger you know area models um, and yeah so it, it started out as some simple scripts to kind of you know take a take a neuron model and then you know kind of duplicate it <laughs> yeah. Because you're modeling but, cells but without the yeah, well, you you know you're modeling like populations of cells, right? Um, and and yeah, what comes out of those dynamics? Like the it, it it strikes me as similar to the kind of stuff that Stephanie Jones is doing at Brown uh, with the um, human neocortical solver. Um, uh, there should be another. <laughs> I know it's hnn.brown.edu, um, and uh, uh, but again, like trying to model populations of neurons as opposed to, you know, each each model being essentially a cell. Yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. So it's not just the cell isn't the unit; it's the population of activity. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Start starting to think at that. You know. Um, I mean, you know, in Stephanie Jones's case, it's like it was very much like trying to model, you know, um, um, EG, MEG uh, population scale, right? Yeah. Uh, Net NetPine was definitely more, uh, you know, lower level or you know, lower, uh, smaller populations, um, and you know, very like intercortical. I can when I when I get home I can drop some more links in the uh, in Slack on them. Okay, that sounds good. As well as the, the meeting details, but yeah. Yeah. Looking to that. Right. And looking forward to looking at those those uh, cellular papers. They, they sound like variants of kind of Morpheus and others. So. Yeah, and it, with those kind of models, it's like imperative that they work. <laughs> like you know, we've yeah, talked about yeah. some of these uh, modeling software that like either very poorly maintained with respect to 2024 oh, yes. or that they're very opaque and you don't know how to set up a model. That's always a problem because yeah, it's in the best way, the best kind of software for that is where it's very much like you can set up a model, maybe even visualized, set the parameters. It's very clear what you're doing when you make manipulations to the model, because that's what you basically are interested in. And, you know, knowing what those outputs are going to do and mean and you know so this, this can be a problem with academic software yeah <laughs> okay well that sounds great uh thank you for attending everyone uh any other comments or questions before we go i would say there's a problem with some commercial software too oh yeah of course <laughs> <laughs> yes true true <laughs> I've been dealing with console, and um, for some reason, when you get it through the academic institutions, there's no help desk. Okay. So I've been using Chat GPT as my help desk for <laughs> console. <laughs> so, like, needless to say, I've just about had enough. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, I think a lot of the excitement around Chat GPT is companies excited that they don't have to do support. <laughs> oh, maybe that's it. Yes, definitely. <laughs> Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for attending, and we'll be back next week. Um, 
I know we're, we're in the Slack as well, so if you want to join the Slack and comment on things, um, we'd be, be, uh, be glad to hear. We're coming up on our decisions for GSOC, so you know that's coming up in the next few weeks. So at the beginning of May, we'll make uh, announcements as to who we're having this summer for Google Summer of Code. Uh, we're still working on selection and finding slots, so hopefully the people will be uh, satisfied with that. And if you don't get selected for Google Summer of Code, you can still work on a project this summer because we're that's what we do in the group. Um, you know, we can maybe work on a project if you want to find funding somewhere else, or if you want to apply again next year. Those are all things that we can do. So don't feel bad if you don't get selected. It's it's. It just really depends on what, how many slots we can get, pretty much. Okay. Thank you. Have a good week. Bye. Bye. Okay, so I'm going to talk about a topic that is close to what we were talking about with SimuCell 3D. And that is talking about cellular sheets and tissues as bio, soft materials. The soft materials that have symmetry, they have some geometry, they have a set of properties, physical properties, but also, uh, you know, their own dynamics and interactions, and also uh, signaling from molecular mechanisms, because remember, they're cells, and they're not like tilings or other types of generic geometric objects, they're cells with a biology. So why don't we get started here? And I have three papers in this collection. So the first one is this paper here from Physical Review Letters, Minimal Model of Cellular Symmetry Breaking. These are people from the Max Planck Institute. And so the abstract of this paper reads, the cell cortex, a thin film of active material assembled below the cell membrane. So this is a, a specific structure within each cell called the cell cortex. It's a thin film of active material. So when we say active material, we mean that it responds to different physical stimuli and it responds in a way that is dynamic. So we'll talk about the cell cortex in a little bit. We've talked about the uh, cell body and how it's not round. It has these... You know, it can conform to different kinds of shapes, and, and so the cell cortex is part of that. The cell cortex plays a key role in cell, cellular symmetry breaking processes, such as cell polarity establishment and cell division. So when we establish the polarity of a cell, we talked about uh, the basal and the apical end, or, you know, it could be an anterior posterior orientation. Those are all aspects of cell polarity. And then cell division, of course, we talked about how you could model cell division as this process of a sphere being pinched in the middle, pulling up each end apart as, you know, with a cell, a sphere that develops two poles, develops this asymmetry, and then breaks apart into two cells. And so there's a whole suite of molecular transformations that occur, but if we want to just model the cell itself, uh, then we have this model of symmetry breaking. So let me show you what we're talking about here. So remember, recall from our uh, previous discussion on modeling cells, if we have a cell here, and we'll model it as a sphere, unfortunately, because we talked about how cells are not spheres, but for the sake of argument here, we'll do a spherical model. And so this is a cell a sphere. This outside is the membrane, and we have the cortex underneath, which is a secondary layer. And then you have the uh, inside of the cell with the nucleus and the DNA in the nucleus, and of course you have the inside of the cell, the cytoplasm and organelles and so that's what we're doing. Now a cell can have, if it's arranged in a, in a sheet like we saw with the epithelial cells, you have two poles here. You have an apical end and a basal end. 
And the basal end is usually anchored to some substrate. And this is very important in physics because what happens is, say I introduce a force to the cell on the left, and it can bend the cell with respect to the substrate. It can also detach it from the substrate. But in biology, usually we have some substrate, and that's the basal portion of the cell body. And then the apical portion can deform as well, so you, sometimes you can get a peak or some other type of deformation in that direction. Now, when we're talking about cell division, we're usually talking about the spherical structure gets constricted along the central axis. And that central axis then serves to pinch the sphere together. So if you go to the next phase here, you get something like this, where it's being pinched from the center. And you start to get the segregation of chromatin, the segregation of the components of the cytoplasm, and of course the cortex has to deform to conform to that sort of activity, these dynamics. Ultimately, this becomes two cells, each with their own cortex, cytoplasmic contents, and nuclei. And so they move apart accordingly. These are the daughter cells that come from this initial cell division event here. So here are two daughter cells in context. So those are the kinds of asymmetries and symmetries we're talking about. There are these asymmetrical processes that can happen during sort of when a cell is anchored to a substrate. There are asymmetries that can happen when a cell is dividing, things can segregate in completely, or you can have daughter cells that are larger than other, that, you know, one daughter that's larger than another, or you can have other asymmetries that result from a cell not being sphere. Here we present a minimal model of the self-organization of the cell cortex that is based on a hydrodynamic theory of curved active surfaces. Now we talked about a, a physical theory uh, a couple of weeks ago. It was live streaming or something like that, and it sounds like it's 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 some internet technology, but it's actually uh, uh, biophysics technique. Actually, it's not biophysics so much, it's it's material science. But this idea that you have this sort of active material and that there are dynamics and that it's involved in liquid in, in being transported through liquids and in, indeed uh cells are very liquid. You know, we have to use liquid theories to describe some of these dynamics because cells are immersed in liquids. We're dealing with liquids and we're dealing with the cytoplasm. We're dealing with liquids when we're dealing with cells migrating and things like that. So hydrodynamics is the appropriate way to view that. And we're talking about curved active surfaces. Again, we talked about curvatures uh, previously in the group. We've talked about sort of how membranes are curved. And so a lot of things happen on these curves. If you look back at our cells, we have the sphere. And of course, I said cells are not spherical, but cells often have a curvature of some type. Even something like this cell here, which is this epithelial cell, it's sort of uh, like um, a rectangle that's upright, but of course it has curvature. And I'm just idealizing it here, but there are a lot of curvatures that happen uh, both on the surface of the membrane, uh, but also within the cytoplasm in terms of migration, in terms of organelle structure, in terms of sort of like, you know, navigating as a liquid. And so there are a lot of things that have to navigate liquids within the cell and between cells. So active stresses on the surface are regulated by a diffusing molecular species. So you can build these models that are hydrodynamic in nature that involve curved active surfaces, but also are minimal models. So the minimal model is a simply a model where you have a cell and that cell is has components, as many components as you want to specify. And, you know, if you have the right conditions, 
at the right framework, then it should give you an answer that's acceptable. It's not going to model everything, but it'll model enough to give a good answer to the question that you're asking. So the active stresses are regulated by a diffusing molecular species. And so a lot of times in uh, cells, you have these active stresses, they're mediated by things, and this is what we're trying to model. We show the coupling of the active surface to a passive bulk fluid. So we have this passive component and this active component. The active surface is uh, the surface of the cell, this curved active surface. And then we have the passive bulk fluid. So we have the surface and we have the fluid dynamics, the fluid dynamics being the environment, which is passive, the surface, the substrate being the active. Enables spontaneous polarization and the formation of a contractile ring on the surface biomechanochemical instabilities. Now we've talked about contractile rings, both in terms of cell division. So this is a contractile ring. And indeed, if we look at some of the models of cell division in bacteria, they have these contractile rings, and we've talked about how uh, genes like FITZ were invo are involved in this sort of form formation of the ring. So, you know, you have molecular models of this, but you also have more generic models. So you can actually have this as a product of physiochemical interactions and not necessarily specific gene expression. Although in biology, we do often see these genes regu upregulated in times where you get these contractile rings that you need to have cell division and other things like that. So you need to be, so these, these contractile rings, they will induce curvatures, like in this case where you're pinching this, uh, the membrane cortex of the cell. And those are all mediated by molecular mechanisms. But in the minimal model, we, could, we don't worry about the specific gene, we just worry about the process. We discuss the role of external fields in guiding such pattern formation. Our work reveals that key features of cellular symmetry, breaking, and cell division can emerge in a minimal model by a general dynamic instability. So again, they're just showing that this minimal model can replicate the biology. They're not interested so much in the specifics, specific species, specific genes. All they're worried about is the, is the, the mechanics the mechanical, uh, the mechanochemical environment, or the mechanochemical drivers. And so this is a great model uh, for looking at these things very generically, you know, maybe being able to derive some insights from this, because it's a very hard thing to model at a very specific level, because you need a lot of experimental information, you need a lot of data, but even when you do have this data, Sometimes it's very hard to really kind of figure out what's going on because there's so much variation across species and across different types of uh, contractile behaviors. The other comment I'd like to make is that, you know, this is very similar to a lot of the morphogenetic models that we've talked about. So Turing morphogenesis, of course, is a reaction diffusion model that has two components, a reaction component and a diffusion component. And in fact, here we also have a reaction component and a diffusion component. We have a diffusion component that's regulating active stresses, and we have a reaction component where the act, where we have this curved active surface that where uh, the change is occurring. So we have this sort of two compartment model as well. So even when they have the minimal model, we have this basic structure. So they talk about the cortex of animal cells being this dynamically cross-linked polymer network. It's located between beneath the cell membrane. And as we know from some of the work we've done on differentiation waves, you know, that polymer network is very important in differentiation. So when that polymer network is deformed or there's, you know, a need to sort of differentiate into a certain cell type, that polymer network needs to be modified somehow. And so there has to be a set of mechanisms that do that. Now, it's, what's interesting, of course, is that the signal to differentiate could come from the environment, but it could also most likely come from genes and proteins being expressed that are very specific to the cell type. So we know that depending on the destination cell during differentiation, the cell has to, you know, make different changes, multitude of changes to get to its destination. 
And so if you're, say, for example, turning the cell into a neuron versus turning the cell into a muscle cell or turning it into some sort of like, you know, skin cell that's a different geometry, the, you know, the, the polymer networks have to contract, and but they also have to conform to different types of shapes. And so there's a lot, there are a lot of interesting questions here. It's not just about pattern formation, it's about triggering those changes and triggering them in such a way so that you can get characteristic structures. So the comment here is that the cortex is interesting because it, you know, the cortical flows and the cell shape changes are connected. The cortex has to interact with the material that surrounds it. So, you know, on one side you have the cell membrane, on the inside of the cell and in contact with the cytoplasm, you have a crowded viscous fluid. So you have this viscous fluid, it's kind of like jelly. It's crowded with things. It's not like just a typical homogeneous material. It's not a typical homogeneous fluid. It's got a lot of aspects. So it's viscous, so it doesn't behave like a linear fluid, but it also is crowded with other things in it, so it has a lot of turbulence. We can use, you know, turbulence at very small scales. Turbulence can play a role in uh, morphogenesis. Uh, it's much different than, say, a laminar flow. And we know that from, uh, from microfluidic chambers and how uh, liquids behave in those environments. By manipulating the cytoplasm mechanically, it has been shown that cytoplasmic flows can directly affect the dynamics of the cortex in the distribution of proteins within it. So this is where we know that like proteins are kind of manipulated by flows and that that's that can play a role in differentiation. The rever so this is one scenario. Now the reverse scenario in which active cortical flows set the cytoplasm fluid into motion has also been observed. So we've got we have the cytoplasmic fluid, cortical flows, meaning the activity of the cortex can push cytoplasmic fluids into motion as they're contracting along with the membrane and these contractile rings are acting, it can actually serve as a causal mechanism for cytoplasmic fluid, fluid flows. So this is all, you know, these are things that happen in the cell. We've observed them empirically. Now we have to model them. And so, you know, we like to take uh, the material as a whole. We don't, you know, we need to figure out a way to model it. So the cell cortex has been successfully described as a thin active fluid film. And so this is from Citation 7. So a thin active fluid film is a sort of soft active material that behaves like a fluid, but is also a film. Many aspects of the cortex's emergent dynamics can be accounted for by considering its generic mechanochemical organization, Citation 8. The concentration of a diffusible chemical species regulates the amplitude of active stress, but also changes dynamically due to infection of the stress regulated by material flows. So we're interested in these diffusible chemical species. This is what they were talking about, about this diffusion compartment, where we have this diffusion component where we have chemical species moving along at some, you know, in, in some concentration or at some rate. And so it's moving through uh, and so it actually regulates the active stress on the surface. So, you know, if you have a flow, it, of course, is producing a stress to the surrounding uh, fluid or the surrounding uh, tissue. So in spontaneous pattern formation, uh, such as in active self-organized active fluids, these have been studied on fixed domains with and without substrate for friction and on deforming surfaces in an environment with a homogeneous pressure. So if we're looking at spontaneous pattern formation, we can look at this in a number of ways. In spontaneous pattern formation is again like this Turing reaction diffusion. We have the diffusion term in the compartment. Now we need a reaction compartment. And that's what we get with some of our, you know, what's going on the surface. Whatever's going on on the surface is the reaction part. And with these, you know, with the substrate, we have the diffusion part. So the diffusing molecular species regulates active tension on the surface. And we show that coupling of the surface to the enclosed fluid gives rise to a hydrodynamic screening length that guides mechanical instabilities to generate well-defined patterns on the surface.
These patterns can govern shape changes. So you can have these changes in shape and which lead to maybe cell division or something else. And of course, because our cell is in a sphere, we can modify the shape of cells, such as having an apical extension. We can also do things like form actual patterns, and that can be done in the same way. So this is a very generic model, but it also allows us to model a wide variety of symmetry breaking points. Okay, so that's that paper. Now I want to get to this other paper called Biological Hypercrystals. And this is in Journal of Physics. And uh, so this is a 20, 2023 paper. And so the abstract reads, the notion of a biological hypercrystal can be regarded as a step towards a broader crystal notion. And, and so we talk about uh, soft active materials, and this is based on the idea of liquid crystal biology or liquid crystal dynamics uh, back from uh, Dejeuner, who actually proposed this back in the 60s. And so this is, uh, you know, when I talk about crystals, I'm not talking about, you know, some sort of woo or you know, something that's fantastical. This is actually, uh, you know, something that we use as a metaphor, you know, that this biological system has these properties that behave like a liquid crystal type interface. So this is uh, a top, a very specific topic in physics that they're kind of talking about here. And they're, diff you know, if we're familiar with liquid crystal TVs, we know that you can use this to, uh, as a conductor, uh, but what we're going to talk about here are some aspects of soft active materials. In this contribution, I consider the geometry of cell patterns and tissues described in terms of Voronoi tessellations and cut in project techniques. So we're talking about um, the geometry of cell patterns in Voronoi tessellation. So we're modeling it with a Voronoi tessellation and cut in project, which is a, you know two different ways of do, modeling this. In this way, we realize that one, Voronoi tessellations early used in the description of atomic and molecular building blocks, distributions in QCs, which I guess are, um, are crystals, um, can be extended to describe the geometry of cell arrangements and tissues of biological interest. And two, the Recourse to higher dimensional spaces can be fruitfully exploited to describe complex order designs in biological systems. So they're using this mathematical tool, this physical tool, to describe some of these kind of systems and the pattern formation that occurs within them. So, you know, we're kind of, in this way, we're kind of looking at sort of the boundary between non-living systems like crystals and living systems like biological pattern forms. And so we're trying to explain these ordered designs or ordered patterns in complex biological systems, and we can do so with this analogy of a crystal. And so this is uh, where they start here. They're talking about um, sort of in, in crystals or non-living ordered compounds where periodic order dominates. Most biological structures exhibit a gallery of hierarchically based structures ranging over several orders of magnitude and size. So you know, instead of having these sort of periodic structures, as you've seen in like different tilings, or you might see in different types of inorganic compounds, um, you see all sorts of different types of pattern formation in biological structures. They're hierarchical because we have these hierarchical systems that have a molecular basis that emerge as these sort of interactions between uh, cells and, and, you know, having tissues and things like that. So we have this hierarchical organization, this vertical organization, that results in these structures that range in different, you know, at different magnitudes. They also combine, so when you look at a pattern, it's aperiodic in the sense that there, there's different order at different spatial scales. So thus going from the macromolecular level to the full-size organism scale, we observe the emergence of novel structural designs at a given scale which are not present at the scales below or above. So if you think about the route of cells to tissues to organs to organisms, you know, that structure isn't self-similar. In this, It's self-similar, but it's not self-similar in a direct sense. So in other words, the organization of cells can be different than the organization of tissues. 
different the organization organs and organisms. So an organism looks very different than its component cells. It looks very different than its component tissues. There are a lot of things that are pattern formation at the organismal level that maybe isn't present at the cellular level or even at the tissue level. And that's because we have this hierarchical sort of a periodicity. Okay, so the presence of characteristic scale transformation in complex biological systems reminds the geometry of, or is reminiscent of the geometry of fractal geometric patterns. And so this is fractals, you know, where we have self-similarity, we have, you know, we have these uh, fractional dimensions and things like that. Uh, nevertheless, ideal mathematical fractals are homogeneous structures exhibiting scale invariant symmetry, which is not generally the case in most biological systems. So again, when we have a mathematical fractal, we have these patterns, these beautiful patterns uh, that occur that are just basically timelines. They're not driven by anything but the mathematics. In biological systems, we have these different scales of organization and of action, so it's not going to look the same. Okay, so soft matter-based quasi-periodic crystals, or QCs, display long-range orderings of molecular motives through the space, which can be properly described in terms of a systematic application of inflation symmetry operations. So from a structural viewpoint, quasi-periodic crystals can be regarded as self-similar molecular aggregates with a translation symmetry. Characteristics of periodic crystals is replaced by a scale-invariant one. The recourse to end Dimensional crystallography allows one to describe uh, quasi-periodic crystals in a Euclidean space of dimension n larger than 3, large enough for recovering periodicity. So we can actually have these spaces that can give us information about this periodicity. So the long-range quasi-periodic order present in QCs can be envisioned as a natural consequence of the incommensurate orientation between the periodic hyperlattice and the 3D physical space. So this is just where we have this sort of uh, ordering of the space, which is this sort of uh, sort of inactive aspect of it or this passive aspect of it, and the active aspect, which is the periodic hyperlattice interacting with that physical space. Thus, hypercrystal would probably be a more appropriate term for condensed matter phases, which can be described in terms of projections from a higher dimensional geometric space. And so, in this cont contribution, we illustrate the hypercrystal notion in the study of the geometrical arrangements of cells and tissues of biological interest, which can be properly described making use of general cut and project techniques, originally introduced in the study of atomic and molecular case quasi periodic crystals. In particular, we will describe the significant role of Voronoi patterns for histological features and curved tessellations stemming from tissue development. So Voronoi patterns are interesting because you describe a space in terms of its centroids, and then you find the packing around it. So you find the optimal distance from each centroid and between each centroid, and then you find the boundaries. So it's like a tiling where you have a bunch of centroids, and you find the mean distance between the centroids, and that changes as you move across the lattice, and so you end up with these circles or other shapes. So we have uh, A, which is the simple epithelium tissue, and we have B, where we have this uh, tiling, this uh, Voronoi tiling, where we have the centroids for each cell, and then we find the optimal distance between each centroid, and we have these boundaries that form. So you have this sort of lattice of uh, different geometric shapes. And so, you know, it's not like a, it's not a perfect lattice of things with all the same shape. It's just the distance, mean distance between the points. And then C, we have this Voronoi diagram based on the location of central veins combined with the original amino stained image. So this is where we have this overlapping with the Voronoi tiling. And you can see how it represents the phenotype. So that gives us an idea of Voronoi tilings and how they relate to these quasi-crystals and looking at the periodicity. Now I'd like to finish up with this paper on, uh, this is from Cnidarian, so this is a, a marine invertebrate, and we're looking at the sea anemone in particular. And we're looking at uh, target genes 
for the novel uh, BMP signaling module. And so this is a little bit different than the other papers because it's looking at this molecular uh, level of organization and it's looking at pattern formation with respect to that. So let's read the abstract and think about how that relates to the other papers. So the abstract reads, BMP signaling as a conserved function in patterning the dorsal ventral body axis in bilateria. So this is our sort of our uh, anatomical symmetry breaking. We have this axis, uh, we have this orientation, and the directive axis in an anthozoans and cnidarians. So far, Nidarian studies have focused on the role of different BMP signaling network components in regulating the PSMAD1-5 gradient formation. Much less is known about the target genes downstream of BMP signaling. So we know sort of the uh, different aspects of the main pathway, but we don't know what's going on downstream. To address this, we generated a genome-wide list of direct PSMAD1-5 target genes at the anthozoan Nematostella vectensis, several of which were conserved in Drosophila and Xenopus. So we have these target genes from this MAD complex in Cnidarians, but we can actually look for ones that are conserved between Cnidarians and Drosophila and Cnidarians and Xenopus, so we, we can capture a larger phylogenetic set of relationships. Our CHIP-seq analysis revealed that many of the regulatory molecules with documented bilaterally symmetric expression in Nematostella are directly controlled by BMP signal. So this is interesting. This means that, you know, if we're looking at symmetric expression and thus symmetry, we can learn a lot about regulatory molecules that are involved in pattern formation. So what we know about BMP signaling is that it's sort of the impetus for pattern formation in different ways in different organisms. But we can look at the symmetric expression as a as sort of an indicator of what kinds of pattern formation is going to be symmetric and what kinds of maybe topological defects we might expect. And so we can base this all on the expression of genes and tissues and in cells and we can see these differences and it, it may be conducive, especially when we know that BMP has a lot of downstream targets conducive to these kind of changes. So we identified several so far uncharacterized BMP-dependent transcription factors in signaling molecules whose bilaterally symmetric, symmetric expression may be indicative of their involvement in secondary axis patterning. So this is where we have this anterior posterior axis and we have this expression of BMP in the cells and we have this uh, bilaterally symmetric expression because the cells will go to their positions on the left and the right and you'll have this expression of symmetry. But then sometimes you have symmetry breaking within that uh, basic framework. So you have a left to right axis, you have an anterior to posterior axis, but sometimes you have things that are asymmetric. So like the human heart is asymmetric with respect to our midline and our, you know, our anterior posterior orientation, which is our head to our, our feet. And so if you have things like a heart, it has to develop asymmetrically. You also have things that are also involved in this sort of uh, secondary axis patterning, meaning that there are other axes that form. So the left-right axis, of course, is maybe a secondary axis to the anterior-posterior axis, uh, because in, say, in C. elegans, you have the anterior-posterior axis is established first in the two-cell stage, and then eventually, as you get uh, uh, cells that have pairs, they usually have left-right pairs, and that happens later in development. So you, this is a secondary axis, and so you get patterning in that way. But you can also have dorsal-ventral patterning, so that's another axis that emerges. So this is all like kind of where we're leading to. We have this, this BMP expression through a simple uh, molecular complex. There's a gradient that forms. You get then the downstream targets of BMP, which lead to pattern formation, and then you have secondary axis or secondary axis patterning, which leads to the sort of the refinement of the basic body group. One of these molecules is ZSWIM 4 6, which includes a novel nuclear protein that can modulate the PSMAD 1 5 gradient and potentially promote BMP dependent gene repression. The editor's evaluation says that this important work presents a systematic survey of downstream target genes of the BMP pathway during body axis establishment in the Nidarian nematostella vectensis. Combining genomic approaches and genetic manipulations across species, they, the authors 
present convincing evidence of Z-SWIM 4-6 acts as a negative feedback regulator of EMP activity. So we have BMP, the downstream targets, Z-SWIM 4-6, which then becomes a negative feedback regulator. These body axes form a Cartesian coordinate system in which the location of different morphological structures are specified by gradients of morphogen signaling. In the case of Nidaria, it's actually outside of Bioteria, but it has a lot of, it's an evolutionary sister group, it's an outgroup that is very similar, and it has a lot of the same molecular um, mechanisms. So we should expect to see in Nidaria the sort of the precursors to things that lead to pattern formation in bioterian species. So this is what they're trying to do. They're trying to find sort of the phylogenetic origins of pattern formation. And I think taken with the other papers, I think it has a good explanation of the sort of multi-range or multi-scale pattern formation and some of the mechanisms behind it, both physical and molecular. So thanks for paying attention. I hope you learned something.